Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, we're live at the Broadcasters Clinic in Madison, Wisconsin. Engineer extraordinaire Mark Persons is with us, along with Chuck Kelly, Linda Bond, and Michelle Vetterkind. And Bill Gould is going to point his dish at us. It's all coming up next on Twerts. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store. With outstanding service, savings, and support. Online at bgs.cc. By the Ruby Console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by the CalRec Type R console system. Type R is a brand new, modular, expandable IP-based radio system from CalRec Audio. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the uh, light bulb at the top of the tower to the microphone down here by us. I got that backwards, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Continue on. You, you can tell I'm nervous that around greatness here. I've Chuck Kelly and Mark Persons are both here. We're going to be talking to them in just a second. I'm Kirk Harnack. I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance. So if you occasionally hear some bias in that direction, well, you know, I know how their stuff works. And I've been uh, talking about their gear for a long time and, and kind of bringing engineers along into the technology as Telos has been advancing it. Also, my co-host is uh, here, Chris Tobin, but he's not in Madison, Wisconsin. Chris, welcome into the show. How are you? I'm <laughs> doing well. I am uh, wish I could be with you guys. I know you're having a good time. But things are good here in New York City. Well, good. Uh, we had a little bit of rain here today, but luckily we've all been inside. We had a lot of fun at lunchtime today. Mark, were you part of that fun at lunchtime? I guess I was. It was great. And, and Chuck's, Chuck's here, too. Chuck, say hi. Hi, hey. Chuck. We're going to uh, actually talk to both these guys here in just a minute, but I want to tell you first that a lot of times when we're on the road, we bring you the show via Max Connect. This is not just a, uh, a 4G modem. You know, this is an off-the-shelf 4G modem. What makes Max Connect different, what gives you great data out of Max Connect, is the fact that you're using a wireless carrier that has priority over everybody else except for first responders. Yeah, so as long as there's no emergency going on, as long as nobody's dying or there hasn't a big wreck or a fire, you've got priority. Your data has priority over all those other jokers who are using their cell phones at the moment. So when we're on the road, we often use Max Connect. Today we're on the Wi-Fi here in the building because it's just crazy good. But if you need to do your remotes with, I mean, just absolute confidence. Bring this with you. You can get this outfitted with two SIM cards, if you like. This one has Verizon and AT&T. I can switch between them. And uh, Chris has used this. We used this from the uh, the NAB radio show in Dallas because uh, the Wi-Fi there was pretty terrible. But this was just great. Got us through the whole time. And uh, Chris, you've got one of these as well. You've uh, you've you've been on location with with the Max Connect, haven't you, Chris? Uh, yes, I have, and I've been uh, doing a lot of studying and reading up on uh, LTE 3GPP and discovering some interesting things about uh, cellular services and how Max Connect has actually helped me to get around some of the shortcomings, despite what the advertising may tell you on, on those major networks for cellular service. <laughs> well, the, uh, what's cool about this is it's not huge speed. You get, you know, five megabits or 10 megabits, whatever you, you pay for, but you get every packet through because you've got priority. So it's great for doing those broadcasts from the ball game, from the parade, from the car dealer, and it works just about everywhere, especially if you've got two different carriers to choose from. Thanks a lot to uh, Josh Bone at maxconnectwireless.com. It's spelled funny, so I have it in the show notes. All right, let's get on with the show. Uh, we've got two guys with us here, two of my favorite people in the world. Mark Persons, I've known you for, good gosh, how long, 87 years? Uh, <clears throat> quite a few God. years. Um, I think when I first met you, uh -huh. Kirk, I had brown hair. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> so did I. You wanted to tell, give us a quick story about writing for Radio World. Well, on our last misadventure uh -huh. on this network, I promised an article about uh, AM directionals. Oh. And it was, uh, we said that if you have a problem with your AM directionals, don't touch a thing until you've read my article. Well, what happened was something got in the middle, and the article that got published sooner than later was the one I titled AM for Dummies. But they didn't, they didn't <laughs> like the title, even though I thought it was perfect, because it really was for young uh, engineers who don't know hardly anything about, uh, about AM. Right. So... Uh, actually, toward the end of the article, it talked about where, where you set the modulation for the sweet spot. 
And so that's how they titled the article, Find Your Sweet Spot, something, something to that effect. So, and I even showed oscilloscope uh, images, and I'm wondering how many people are looking at that saying, what is that? <laughs> but, uh, but I also prefaced it saying that in an earlier article in Radio World, I had uh, explained oscilloscope use. So hopefully they can tie all that together. So if people want to find that article, do you know remember which uh, which edition that was in? Well, in it's it, it's it's early October, as in right now. Oh, okay, okay. So if you yeah. if you just Google Mark Persons Radio World and what mm -hmm. sweet spot? Uh, could be, could be. Could be. Okay. Uh, actually, I found it online, uh -huh. uh, RadioWorld.com, and then under tech, whatever techs and hints. And but I haven't seen the printed copy yet because uh -huh. I've been away from home. But anyway, it's just helping others. It's like mentoring, which is exactly where I'm at with four, count them, four broadcast engineers. You're really big in the SBS uh, mentoring program. I, I am. In fact, to the point where I hope I'm not monopolizing the Ooh. audience here. Um, I was doing it long before the SBE had a program. And, I, and one of the reasons was I had enough money. I didn't need the business. So I, these people just latched on to me saying, well, I need some advice. Well, fine, sit down and I'll give you the advice. And besides, when you get to be old, you love to sit down and talk while others are going, oh, listen. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't Shane Tovin an early uh, um, he, he was. protege? And, and isn't he, hasn't he matured? He is just fabulous. Uh, he's always been immature, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I met him when he was in high school. Oh, my. Okay. He was working uh, at a public non, non-affiliated station. He wasn't with Minnesota Public Radio, but it was just a public station. And... I just gave him a little encouragement. He just blossomed. It was great. The tech so stuff really, you can it's teach. him. All he yeah. needed was a couple good words. The tech stuff you can teach. It's the passion that oh. needs to be there. And that's what you uh. see in these young people. I see in these young people. Is you, you start with the passion. Everything else can be taught. Yeah. And it, and, and he just he's just a sponge. He just <laughs> ate it up. And he's, and he's just great. The guy, is, he's more than I ever was now. I also give two thumbs up to the mentor program. I've been a mentor twice now. Oh. Mm -hmm. And the last guy just graduated out of engineering. He's now a host for an NPR station. Really? Yeah. Okay. okay. He's always done both things. So now he's <laughs> he's doing that, and I'm proud of it. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, we certainly need it in the industry. We do. We do. All right. <clears throat> Mark, what's up with your tie? You, I want to give you oh, 10 seconds the tie. for that. <clears throat> you know, it's, why is it that engineers are out there, and they're, they're using these things called transistors? Yeah. But the latest technology, is, as some have described as uh, vacuum tubes, they're hollow state technology. Ha empty state technology. Empty state. Instead of solid state, it's, it's empty state. Empty state. That's yeah. right. So there's this glass envelope, and inside there are these magic elements that uh, can, can, can amplify a signal or oscillate or something like that. Absolutely unknown to any young person today. <laughs> Where do you get a tie like that? <laughs> I got it from Shane Tolvin. What? Where did he get it? I don't know, but it was great. And oh, by the way, my tie tack, I want you to show you my tie tack. It's a microphone that I got from NAB. Is it wireless or is there a tiny wire going uh, to a recorder it, it in your pocket? Be, no, it's, it's uh, I don't know. If, Speak closer to the microphone. Do, do you know a couple of guys named Brennan and Clapper? Are you involved with them? <laughs> <laughs> so, so everything you're you're saying has been recorded by my microphone uh -huh. here. You see, and distributed uh, worldwide. Yeah. For the <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Sure, <laughs> bigger audience than the show has. <laughs> it's always good to see you, Mark. Always good to see you too. And I, I, I want to encourage folks to to take advantage if you haven't heard it, and most of you have not. There's a book that Mark's dad wrote that uh, Mark. Uh, allowed me to make the uh, audiobook version of that book. You it, did that. It's called. And it, 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 it's called. Where have all the broadcasters gone? My father wrote it late in his life, talking about all the people he had met along the way because he started in the 1920s, and then you, bless you, Kirk, recorded it so that it's available for anyone at no charge, no sign-up fee. Uh, you could go to my website, mwpersons.com, mwpersons.com, mm -hmm. click on the link that says something to do with old old, uh, old radio, yeah. something like that, and boom, you'll be there, and all the episodes are there. 
it, it's on YouTube as well. So just okay. look for uh, uh, Where Have All the Broadcasters Gone on YouTube. It's uh, How many chapters was that book? 14 or so? 16? Whatever it is. There's a video for every chapter. And so you can you can listen to it that way. It's also on SoundCloud, okay. and you could search on SoundCloud and find it there mm -hmm. too. But I think it's a fascinating look at history. And the only thing that went wrong with the whole thing was that my family was from Minnesota, Minnesota, and, and in Minnesota, <laughs> and, and, and you have this halfway southern accent <laughs> to go with it. You see, <laughs> so so please. I, <laughs> Hey, Mark, bring him cheese curds over here. <laughs> that doesn't sound the same, does it? It doesn't sound the same. <laughs> but the content is there, and you did a marvelous job reading it. I had a blast doing it, so I'd encourage you to go find Where Have All the Broadcasters Gone? Just Google it, and you'll, you'll find it for free. It's interesting. When did he write that book? Well, it was, uh, let's see, he died in uh, 1998 or something like that. So he wrote it in the... Uh, late 80s, I think. So this problem that we're dealing with, with a dearth of broadcasters, has been around with us for a very long time. Well, they were, there were more people, engineers, mm -hmm. used to be amateur radio operators. Yeah, some they, still are. They knew which way electrons <laughs> flew went in a wire. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's the way I grew up. I was supposed to, I, I learned all those things. Mm -hmm. So it was just natural to just pick up something and say, okay, I'm going to make those electrons go this way. And I sure. did. Sure. But I think we're lacking some of that today in people who may, might start out in IT and they don't understand Ohm's law. Right. And so I've been trying to do, I did a, a Radio World ar article on Ohm's law and how it applies to everything that we do. Because when I worked on transmitters or other parts of radio stations, if something went wrong, I'd say, now let's see, volts, amps, watts. Oh, I see what went wrong. <laughs> and it all starts to make sense. And that's good for big signal stuff. But what happens when you get into something that's the small signal stuff that's throughout our industry at this point, and it's all surface mount devices, oh. Oh, yeah. even if you do know Ohm's Law, <laughs> okay. good luck, you know? Maybe I retired at the right time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mark, thank you for joining us. I You're really welcome. appreciate your presence. And I wonder, I'm going to ask you on camera if you would do me a tiny little favor. Yes. Do you know uh, Linda Bond? Yes, I do. You know Michelle Vetterkind? No. You don't know Michelle? She's the, well, she's the head of the Wisconsin Broadcast. Okay, fine. And there's also an, enge an engineer here named Brittany Williams. She's the director of engineering for Wisconsin Public Radio. Okay. Anyway, if you could find one of them and send them over here, oh, remind them of their appointment. Of course. That would oh, be great. An appointment. They're probably right around the corner they're, here. They're they're probably, they probably are. Yeah. Probably. Or they're avoiding us. Well, that's good. Did I finish everything on my list? Did Let you? me see. Uh, yeah. Mentoring. Mentoring. I really, really enjoy that. Good. And it, it makes me feel good, even though I don't get a penny for it. But I earn my money. Well, that's the best feeling right there. I, I'm okay. And I don't need or want any money for it. I just want people to get better at what they do because I really believe in radio. Me Always too. have. I started. Can, can, can you bring that dish over to us? Okay. Yeah, that dish that's on it. Can you bring it over here? <laughs> That'd be awesome. I, I've been trying to find one, it. One more quick note here. Okay. Uh, I knew at age five that I was going to be a radio broadcast engineer. Mm -hmm. How many people at age five know what they're going to do? Me too. You, 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 you <laughs> I called the local radio station in Champaign, <laughs> Illinois, okay. and said, I want to be the guy who maintains all the technical equipment. What do you call that? And they said, an engineer. And I said, I don't want to work on trains. I want to work <laughs> on radio station equipment. <laughs> and so how did, but you knew by what? Because you told a story before of something about the curtains. The, the what? The no? curtains at, at your house. You want to climb towers. Oh, towers. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I've never had afraid of uh, been afraid of heights, and I think I showed a photograph of me at age four climbing pipes. These are the pipes that Holmes had for uh, for the radiators, mm -hmm. the hot water and the cold water. One yeah. hot. Anyway, there I was climbing up near the ceiling. So my 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 <laughs> folks knew that uh, I was probably not afraid of heights, and I he's I'd got like the neck. climbing towers. <laughs> you don't know how many people think that an engineer climbs towers. I mean, that's just that's a natural. There's reaction. a lot of people that think engineers fix chairs too, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and toilets, and, and toilets, and, and deliver and flowers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> gone to those days. Wow. But anyway, I knew I was going to be an engineer, so it's just been my life. So, and it turns out it paid for my existence here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was just a marriage made in heaven. You bet.
Absolutely. Yeah. And maybe for you too, Chuck, Absolutely. and for this young man. I, I didn't, I, I wanted to be a disc jockey, but I stuttered. They, they oh. say that if you love what you do, yeah. you'll never work a day in your life. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is and that. And I think it's true. It's it's true a lot of days. This is all I ever wanted to do. <laughs> so Anyway, I've taken up way too much of your all time. All right. Go, go, I'll, I'll Mr. Stage Manager, go, go see find those people. Go see if you can find just, those people. I, I'm the stage mangler. That's it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Chuck Kelly is with us. Well, thank you, Mark, for being with us. Appreciate it very much. Chuck Kelly is with us. But we've got to uh, hear from our friends at Broadcast Tools and Broadcaster General Store. And so Chris Tobin is going to tell you about the Broadcast Tools Pro Mix 4, and we'll be right back. All right. Well, welcome to This Week in Radio Tech. And uh, Broadcast as General Store is good enough to work with us. And we're going to work with Broadcast Tools about the Pro Mix 4. Now, you may say to yourself, what is a Pro Mix 4? It's real simple. It's a four input mixer for outside broadcast, on location, remotes, whatever you call it. And it's for sports and all can be for spoken word. So, you have a talk show. And I know I've had experiences where I could have used it easily because I do a talk show from time to time on the road. And it would have been ideal. It's a nice small footprint. It gives you IFB capabilities. So, you can mix IFB and program into the queue, into the headphones of your host or guest depending on who needs it. So with that in mind, let's see, it's very small compact, it's got an LED display as you can see here. And what you notice is it's four buttons, and the buttons are red. And you know, maybe people may not think it's important, but you know when you're busy doing a broadcast, you look down, you got a quickly mem muscle memory, you look down, you know the buttons, what they are, on and off for your inputs and outputs. So it's important to understand why the colors are where they are. And notice also the arcing white semicircle. Again, Quickly, when you're doing a broadcast and you're trying to wonder why what's happening, what are you doing? You quickly look down, you turn up or turn down, you know what you're going to get. You don't have to figure out numbers in 0 to 10 or whatever. So it, I point this out, it's very important because when you're doing events and in broadcasting especially, it's mission critical, we overlook the obvious. And the folks at Broadcast Tools and the guys behind it, I'm not going to get into the details of who it is in particular, but there's several people, we all know who you are, have thought it out well. They've listened to their customers and a lot of customers in broadcasting are very vocal, which is a good thing for manufacturers on a, on a good day. Also, on the back, the inputs, the IOs are quarter inch and XLR. So it's very universal and very robust. Quarter inch connectors, we know, can withstand most beatings along with uh, XLRs. And there's also a USB port, so you can have a sound. This could be now a sound card to a computer you see on the rear of the unit. And there are other options that the RJ45 can uh, allow, you, allow you. Those are options for the Hub 6, which does more program distribution, IFB direction, and many other things, but we won't get into that right now. So just to recap and remember, it has balanced manual program output with defeatable soft clipper. So yes, you may need a clipper just to keep things a little you know, in, in check for downstream, depending on what you're, you're plugging into, but it's, it's selectable. It's full duplex talkback capability. Very important to know. That's also with, you can use the Hub 6. Keep that in mind if your needs require it. You may not need it, so you don't worry about it. IFB audio input with level adjustment. How many times have you been to a location, maybe a presser, and you find yourself getting a return feed? You can't control the level. Here you can. So now your host, your guests, everybody working with you can easily be controlled and you don't have to have panic and feedback and all kinds of other crazy things that do occur. I've been there, done it. I can say it from experience. Pro Mix 4 helps in every way possible and thinks about, uh, has thought, they've thought the design into your event. And I say spoken word. I said sports. It could be evangelical. It could be anything that requires mixing of four channels of audio and controlling what they hear or don't hear. Maybe it's just one direction. So be it. It's compact. How many times do you set up for a broadcast and you got 12 cases and you send yourself, uh, where do we put that? I don't Pro Mix 4 is the center. One box, one case, whatever you want to call it. Your necessary cables, four mic input cables, done. Oh, we need two outputs for headphone control, done. Three outputs, done. Five cables. Six, you have six cables, Pro Mix 4, a power strip for all this stuff like, you know, laptops, things like that, tablets, in one case. Now what you got? You got a full blown studio on location, one case, Pro Mix 4, broadcast tools problem solved. It's really straightforward. Just keep that in mind. I could go for hours talking about all the various things you can do with the Pro Mix 4. It's only your imagination or your passion to get the job done. So have fun making money in broadcast. Pro, Pro Mix 4 can do it for you. And it does have on-air tally warning light relay output, just in case for those really crazy engineers <laughs> who want to have some tally conditions on location, because that's just how we are. We don't have a tally light here, but we got enough people looking and staring at us. I, I think... <laughs> I think they know what's going on. Chris, thanks. The, the Pro Mix 4 from Broadcast Tools is available from our sponsor, Broadcasters General Store. They're here at the Broadcasters Clinic because they support lots of state shows and, of course, uh, the NAB uh, radio show and the main show. Check them out at bgs.cc. That's bgs.cc. All right. Hey, we got Bill Gould in here for just a second because I saw this on display. 
What kind of death ray is that? Ah! Pointed over that way, not this way. I may want to have kids. <laughs> Bill Bill Gould is eight. Bill, how are you? This is I'm doing well, thanks. Yeah. This is the uh, the outdoor unit and a one foot antenna for our next gen T product. That looks like a piece of military it's, hardware. Well, it's pretty heavy. Man. Pretty, pretty heavy. They even, that, that would scare ISIS even, right there. Even to sit here and hold it. But uh, what's the range on that? Uh, depends on the size of the dish. This well, is but about, it's a one foot. Yeah. Yeah. This is about the biggest dish that I'd want to bring to a show. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> or point at somebody. Or point at somebody. <laughs> Will it melt chocolate bars? But, uh, no, but it does a pretty good job on moths. <laughs> it takes oh. them right out. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, so. uh, I, I saw this, and Bill, this is part of your. Very reliable uh, IP radio links, right? That's correct. Yeah. This this next gen T link, it's uh, it's actually a 150 megabit radio. Yeah, and yeah. so there's plenty of bandwidth to do things like uh, live wire, yeah. for example. Yeah, uh, or the the wheat yep. or uh, uh, what do you call Ravenna. it? Uh, MPX over. Uh, over ADS, oh, yeah, over yeah IP. 400 kilobits per second. MPX oh, no, you can do IP. the wideband. You can you do can the, the wideband. Absolutely. 192. Sure, sure. You know, and you do several of them. Yeah. To, to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it has plenty of leftover bandwidth for, for all your IP applications as well. So, uh, and and this runs in, these run in 6, 11, 18. They're licensed bands. All those bands, yeah. they're licensed yep. and they're available to broadcasters for STL. And can your, can Mosley provide us with information on how to get the licensing done? Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Hey, I'll, I'll talk to you later. I just wanted to, okay. to, to show that off. Bill Gould <laughs> from Mosley, and he's here at this show. And of course, you can catch you guys at, at your website, right? Mosley. Yeah, MosleySB.com. MosleySB.com. All right. Bill, I'm going right. to, I'm going to turn your mic down. I'm going to care. Y your hands are full. I'm going to take this off of you for you. Okay. All righty. That's we've known Bill for years. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate Take care, it. Bill. Come on in here, Chuck. Good to see you. Good to see you, my friend. So you're, at, of course, everybody knows. I guess everybody knows you are at Elenos now, and the BE and Broadcast Electronics BE. and Telco and oh, Pro yeah. Television. So we are a group of companies now. And so you've got this all this technology that I think you have plans to make some of these things work together. Yeah. There's a lot of synergy in our companies, and, yeah. and that's the fun part. I mean, I was with Broadcast Electronics for 18 years, yeah, and then 13 years ago went to a Canadian company, and now I'm back. So you want to chat a bit more about the mentor program. Yeah, it's very, I was very just, important to you. I, I, it is very important, and I think it's important to all of us, but there's a, an underlying issue or question that I wanted to bring up, and it is that, that – um, in some things, we, we think that mentoring is the only way to solve the problem, but there's a bigger issue. And that is this, um, even though you may be technically interested, even though you may be um, uh, qualified technically, um, is, it the best, is, it the, is it the best career for you? I ask you this, you've got a son. Yeah. He's growing up. Yeah. If he got a technical bent and, and he became qualified, would you as a father suggest to him or a daughter for that matter, mm -hmm. suggest mm -hmm. to them that they become broadcast engineers? I would suggest if, if they if they think they like what Daddy does, I have no indication that they do. But if if Michael thinks he likes what Daddy does, um, there's and, not a part of you that would say no, you could make more money, you could ooh, not work as long ooh. the hours, you could you could uh, not necessarily work on dangerous circuitry all the time. Well, see, I I believe that that in my engineering skills, I work in content creation and delivery. Right. And because with the advent of streaming, I work in delivery, and I always have for, as you sure, have for decades, sure. yep. in high power transmitters. Right. I'm glad I didn't die working on transmitters. Yep. Uh, and I hope I never do. But I, I like, I do like the different disciplines. But what I would, I would, I would ask my son, make sure that your, that your love is broad. That you want to, you want to help people create content that other people want to enjoy. And if that's a mix engineer or I agree. Whatever. I agree with that, but I believe our industry would be better served uh -huh. if if broadcast engineers made a little bit more money. I don't know if you've been watching some of the help wanted ads and things, but it's embarrassing. You know, a guy who who, who fixes tires for a living or, or or shovels snow for a living makes more money than a lot of broadcast engineers. And I, you know, the the, the title of Mark's father's book. Where have all the broadcasters gone? Right. Is similar to a, a comment I made to a friend of mine. If you want to help change this industry, explain to the owners of stations, and you are one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Explain to the owners of stations that we're all turning very gray, and there's not going to be broadcast engineers around to get. And and title the article that you're going to write for RBR or 
or radio magazine, who are you going to call? Yeah. Yeah. It ain't Ghostbusters. No, it's not. And and part of the problem, I believe, is is the, the radio, the local radio broadcast business model. Yep. I mean, I'm not sure. There may be some owners there who are just cramming their pockets full of cash that they could have paid to an engineer. But I don't think there's very many of those. No, no probably not. Yeah. And as an owner of 14 radio stations, I can tell you that I know my bread is buttered at the Telos Alliance. I understand. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's the problem. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. the problem. It's not, you know, if we if we suddenly take the mentorship program, and I hope we do, I'll do my part. I've done yeah. two already. I'll continue to do it. But if we suddenly make that grow and we've got more broadcast engineers and they can't find work that keeps food on the table for their families, then what are we going to do? Well, that's why I believe you, you could. I believe I could go get a job at uh, helping people build recording studios or podcast studios or be involved with one of these maker places where people can come and record podcasts or audio. Sure. There's a lot of things that as a broadcast engineer, I, I can even fix a toilet. And I learned that at a radio station. Of course you did. <laughs> because they expected that was they part of your job. That was part of my job. <laughs> Not saying I agree with that, but fair enough. I, a, lot, how, a lot of broadcast engineers you know have a lot of skills. Absolutely. Very wide range. Absolutely. So. Thanks for your thoughts on that. My pleasure. I, I'm like you, like everybody we talk to in this wonderful show here. I have a lot of passion for this industry, yeah. and I, I hate to see it change substantially. Not on our watch. Coming up in about six or seven weeks or so, Chuck is going to be joining us every show for mm -hmm. a quick look at what's going on in technology in the uh, companies that you're part the of. The LNS Group. That's the right. The LNS Group. I'm right. delighted to do that. Good deal. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Good to see you. Good hey, to see you. Don't go away right now. I'm going to turn your mic down and turn yours up. Hi. Do a switch o change here. Hi there. This is Linda Bond. Hi, Hi, Linda. Thanks so, for having me. It's, uh, finally, somebody on the show who's <laughs> not taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Let's see. We can move which way? The, uh, no, no. That, that way. Sorry. This here one? in the middle of the camera. There we go. That's close there enough. You go. Good deal. So, what time is it? Uh, okay, we're gonna we're gonna talk for a couple minutes. Okay, Linda, you I, you're the only person that I really that I communicate with on this show, mm -hmm. on this this mm -hmm. broadcaster's clinic. Mm -hmm. Do you run the whole thing? I do. You do. Let me turn your mic up a little bit more. Check, check, check. Say check for me. Check. Okay, good. Yeah. So you, I get all these wonderful emails from you, and you are so gentle and kind and yet like kirk I, I need this <laughs> yeah we're a small office there's four employees uh -huh. and so we're all dedicated to different facets within the broadcast industry and my passion of course has always been the engineers um in a previous life as certification director mm -hmm. for the society of broadcast engineers and i'm going to um, tell my age a little bit, but I've been involved now in the industry over 25 years. Okay. And so therefore, I got your way beat. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore I've seen a lot of change, but the constant is the per the people at the stations and we need them and we need to let them know that they are so appreciated and through all the technology differences, they're still there. So this show is huge, and people come from how many states to be here? This year we have 29 states. What? Yeah. And that, um, I don't count exhibitors. Yeah. I don't count speakers. Yeah. I'm counting those that are actually engineers in the field. Over, ha over half of the American states are represented right. here Alaska, with, with engineers. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. Saw, I saw John here from Alaska. Yeah, right. Wow. Now, you have another... Um, thing earlier in the summer every year we do we do it in conjunction with the um summer conference where the wba is um board based we have a board that believes so much in the engineers mm -hmm. that they underwrite the broadcasters clinic as well as the summer conference engineering day and with their help and their support this show has grown immensely and of course the exhibitors and the attendees you're not good without the content as you pointed out um our content is phenomenal both in the summer and in the, the show here we also have a dedicated broadcasters clinic committee uh -huh. that helps us with the programming and at the end of the day we go around and we say okay if we were attending the show a would we send somebody b would we pay and C, is it worth the time away from the station given our busy schedules? So that's what 
fundamentally grows this show. Now, from the Wisconsin broadcaster's uh, perspective, I see we have the Society of Broadcast Engineers here, and they're holding right. their annual meeting here. In fact, uh, just a little while, I've got the board of directors dinner right. and the board of directors meeting. That's a four-hour meeting. <laughs> Did I mention it's a four-hour meeting? Hey, ours is finished, and it was yeah. two. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you could uh, – uh, how, how did – how did it come about that SBE is uh, holding their meeting in uh, conjunction with yours? We invited them. Um, they send out uh, to the different shows um, in the different states that there's SBE shows, um, letting them know that they're looking for venues to go to. And we invited them to come and join us. And their board uh, accepted our invitation. And we're thrilled to have them here. Good. So it's a good fit for all of us. Well, I think I was on the committee that helped uh, decide, hey, we sure would like to go back to Madison. There you go. But, you know, the, the SBE um, uh, annual meeting is held in, in a service. Right. And there's no exact rhyme or reason. It's just wherever, where haven't we been to? Where can we draw people from? And who wants to host us? Correct. So Yeah. And we're glad that you're here. So the way this conference typically works is uh, today, Tuesday, is kind of a radio-centric day. Correct. What's tomorrow? Both. It's both radio and television in general. You know, some some sessions that in the past we've had is like on, been on grounding, and mm -hmm. it's topics that will fit both a radio and television station. So. And then Thursday. It's all television. All television. Yeah. Wish I didn't have to leave. I'd love to stay for that. <laughs> Going to New York City. Linda, you. thank you so much for being thank with us. Thank you for having me. It's been great um, talking to you, too. Come back again someday. Okay. Hey, uh, you think you could find either Michelle or do you know Brittany Williams? I do. Oh, I'd love to. If we, if one of them could pop by the booth, that'd just be awesome. I will do that. Okay. okay great. Hey, we're going to be right back. Thanks, Linda. Linda Bond from uh, the uh, Wisconsin Broadcasters Association. I'm Kirk Harnack, and glad that you're along. Our show is brought to you in part by our friends at CalREC and Angry Audio. We'll be right back. Calrex Type R is a modular, expandable IP-based radio system featuring three slimline panels, a fader panel, a large soft panel, and a small soft panel easily configured to give the operator full control. Layouts are saved and recalled quickly between shows. A single 2RU core with integrated I.O. gets customers up and running fast, and that single core can power up to three independent mixing environments with no sharing of DSP resources. Available in four DSP packs, and as your station grows, larger packs can be added, enabling it to grow with you. Power to the surface is supplied via standard PoE switches, keeping cabling to a minimum. Type R is fully AES67 compatible, as defined by SMPTE 2110, which means that it is also compliant with NMOS discovery and connection management specs. All these features combined make Type R the most flexible radio console you can buy. Find out more at calrec.com slash twerk. Thanks a lot, Cal Reckering, this week in Radio Tech. And our show is also brought to you by our friends at Angry Audio, angryaudio.com. i got to show you this. I got, I got my box here of goodies. We used to have to say Angry Audio because the name Studio Hub had not yet been transferred. But now, now, you know those Studio Hub adapter cables that you like, these right here, that so many radio stations and TV stations have been put together with these and just quick, quick, connect, click, click, and put a put a uh, Cat5 cable in there, and you've got RJ45, like on the back of so many AOIP audio devices uh, from the Telos Alliance and from Wheatstone and from uh, you know, things that are Ravenna, uh, things from Lavo, things from CalRec. they all got this on it. And the other end, you get whatever kind of connector you want. Male XLR, female XLR. There's a female XLR right there coming right out to, uh, to that, to a, a male RJ45. And look, if you need a longer one, you got that too. Go to the website. It's angryaudio.com. Angryaudio.com. And these are all the Studio Hub brand adapters. They're made in the same factory by the same people, the same molds and, and jigs used to make the uh, Studio Hub. And now they still say Studio Hub on them. Plus, all the electronic items, including the the, uh, the the old radio systems Millennium consoles, those they got parts for those at AngryAudio.com. They got a uh, special deal going on right now too. If you buy uh, this kind, this gray kind of cable that's got the female RJ45, buy one of these, you get a free seven foot uh, Cat5 patch cable, and that way, hey, you're good to go. You can go seven feet with that sucker 
almost eight feet with this. And uh, you get that for free. That's, you know, those things usually cost two, three, four, five, six dollars, depending on where you buy them. And one more cool deal. All the items that you've been used to paying about twenty dollars for the, the 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 adapter cables like these, the high quality, all molded, just good stuff. They're all about twenty five percent less money now. Twenty five percent less, and for a limited time, a free seven foot Cat five cable. Check them out. Go to angryaudio.com. Angryaudio.com. Thanks a lot for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, hey, it's Kirk Harnack. We're live at the Wisconsin Broadcasters. Broadcasters Clinic in Madison, Wisconsin, goes on every year. Chris Tobin's along, and I'm sorry, Chris, I didn't get a word in edgewise, but look, look, look at the wonderful things I'm surrounded with here. Come on in, Michelle. Now, I, I got to say, Michelle, Michelle, uh, I know that my first name, Kirk, yes. is, is, is one of it's your... very special to it's me. It's one of your the special, special... <laughs> before you get the wrong idea, before you get the wrong idea, <laughs> what's your husband's name? Kirk. Hey. Kirk is in Captain Kirk. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. I always remember your name. <laughs> so, M Michelle, um, you you do what here? Because what Linda says she does everything. What do she you does, do? She does. She does. <laughs> <laughs> I I I technically I'm the president and CEO, but you know what? I I Linda puts her heart and soul into this, and uh, she does an amazing job with Broadcasters Clinic. Her and the and the rest of the WBA team. It, so you know what? I just I I I know it's going to be great. And uh, I support it definitely, but I let her do what she wants to do. It sounds so. <laughs> it, um, it sounds like you surround yourself with some good people and let them Very do, much do so. their jobs. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. And that's my history. I was vice president before I became president. Okay. So so I do have history certainly with uh, with Linda's job, but I will tell you, obviously, uh, uh, broadcast engineers uh, are very, very special. Now, you, po you post sometimes on behalf of uh, the broadcasters. I've, I've yes. seen your post. Um, oh, yes. Now, is your background in broadcasting or in associate management or what, what's your uh, background? Well, actually, I've been with the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association for 24 years. No way. Yeah. Okay. So I've been president for 12 and a half years, but I've been there 24. So it's hard to remember, Kirk, what I did before that. But higher, technically higher out of middle school. <laughs> You're a dear soul. Um, technically, sales and management. Okay. That's, my, oh, okay. that's my background. And yeah. and you do have conferences for sales and management. Oh, yes. You? Yeah. Is that, yes. is that the summer conference or something uh, else? Uh, summer, winter. Winter is more state legislative. Oh. Uh, student seminar. We have sports. Uh, but you know what? With Broadcasters Clinic, we have attendees from 29 states. I heard. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations. You've got a very successful show going on this year. Thanks, attendance, I guess, Attendance, Terrific. attendance is fantastic. Yeah, 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 record attendance. And thank you for. I noticed at the door if anybody yes. brought in some rotten fruit. Yes, th that was confiscated at the door. So <laughs> I knew I would be safe. <laughs> and and we do have our cheese curds. We do have our fried cheese curds. I haven't had one yet. Oh my god, you have to. Have you have to. to. It's at nuts and bolts tonight. So. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. Well, I got to be at that uh, SBE board of directors meeting. All right, I'll uh, see you there. I'm yeah. stopping in to welcome okay. everybody there too. Thank you. Good All right. Michelle Vetterkind, thank you very much. Thanks, Kirk. Say hi to my buddy, Kirk. I Ford. will. I will. <laughs> definitely. Right. Thanks a lot. Hey, we're joined now by Kathy Oros. Did I hear you say your name? That's right. Oros. Yep. Kathy Oros with the Society of Broadcast Engineers. And look, we're right in front of your booth. That's right. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> that is. Yeah. So, Kathy, you, um, what do you do at SBU? I am the Education Director for the Society of Broadcast Engineers. And i um, proud of all the education programs that we have to offer to Broadcast engineers. So that means uh, uh, webinars. You you right. handle t scheduling those, taking care of right, them? Yes. right, and and that's uh, that's a great great uh, topic. We have over a hundred webinars, and and monthly we have about two two new ones every month uh, that yeah. people can take advantage of. Um, if you are not a member of the SBE, you might want to consider becoming a member. Plus, uh, you get those member that you get those webinars for free. So. That's something to consider. That is a great benefit. That's what mm -hmm. I do. I'm a member plus. And yeah. I got to tell you, you know, the one thing about a webinar, it's at a specific time. Right. And I always have such high hopes that I'll be available at that time. And so I sign up for the webinar. Right. And then almost invariably something comes up. Right. But... I'm not out of luck, am I? That's absolutely right. I mean, we always we always record our webinars and they're archived. And if you signed up for it and thought, oh, I'm going to be at the live webinar, just like you said, um, no worries because you get that webinar uh, just within like two business days after that. And you can watch it at any time. Um, or if you just totally space the whole thing to begin with and, and have to, you go to the website and you see a whole library of archived webinars uh, and things on various topics. The webinars are such a huge resource for our industry. Mm -hmm. so you can find out 
just so much. If you're a member plus member, you can go back all the way to the first webinar, right? That's absolutely right. Yeah, okay. they're all archived and um, and available to members and non-members as well. And if you haven't heard of member plus, the reason that we did that, the board of directors had this idea presented, we approved it, uh, what, a year and a half? Two, yeah, but, yeah ago. Two. And the idea is that you, we used to have a, a fairly... Uh, cheap or moderate price for being a member mm -hmm. and then we would charge for webinars okay mm -hmm. that's reasonable but guess what some engineers said i can't go back to the well you guys have five great webinars this year that i want to attend and i can't go back to my boss and ask for another 80 bucks or 70 bucks mm -hmm. or whatever it may be for a webinar so we said tell you what you buy the member plus membership you go to your well if you will once mm -hmm. that membership costs the same or, or less as many other professional memberships, mm -hmm. a lot less right. than some, and you get all the webinars for free, including all the back webinars. Right. And if you've watched two webinars a year, that member plus membership pays for itself. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. 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 And now, we've a couple of people here have mentioned the uh, the mentor program. Right. You're in charge of, of yep. handling that? Yep. And Chris Tarr is our, our committee chair for that. We're a great team. We've gotten um, over... Oh, we have 30 mentors and about 30 mentees. Um, we're trying to pair up people in similar markets with similar skills, uh, but we want to, you know, welcome anybody who wants to come to that. Um, you have to be an SBE member to be a part of that program. And I'm just right now, I'm in the process of chatting with the mem mentors and mentees and seeing how those pairings went and we'll, uh, we'll pair up people towards the end of the year, but it's an ongoing program and any time during the year, anybody can come on. Good deal. Yeah. And if they want more information, go to sbe.org. Yeah. Or give me our, or shoot me an email or go to sbe.org. That's Kathy with a C. C. Last name's kind of weird. Oros. <laughs> Haven't heard that before. <laughs> right. But, but you, you can find it. Look for mentoring on the website. That's right. sbe.org. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy, Kirk. Thank you so much. I appreciate yep. you being here. Very good. And Mr. David Layers waiting in the wings over here. If we can figure out which uh, headset he's putting on. Let's see, David, are you, uh, you must be on that one. I am. Hi. Oh, wait, wait. Oh. Say hi. Hello. Hi. Say again. Oh, yeah. how about that one? <laughs> there we go. You're on that one. Hey, how's it going, Craig? So uh, come on come on in. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Oh, maybe the camera will lighten up a little bit. Yeah. Why is everybody taller than me? <laughs> Maybe if I stand way up front here, I'll. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my TV contract. I'm not as tall as I used to be. A TV, I, I always stood on an Apple box. Yeah. 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 Worked out. So, what, I, I missed most of your presentation oh, today. Tell us what that, that was about. So, today I was talking about hybrid radio. Ah, and I, okay. I used the example of Audi, who are going to start selling an, an A4 in the U.S. with hybrid radio mid year next year. So, I used that as a way of explaining some of the things that hybrid radio does in general, and then in some of the things that Audi's hybrid radio does in particular. The, the, this word hybrid is problematic because it means so many things. You know, Telos makes hybrids, right? Oh, e I know. E ERI, hybrid Eibach. ERI makes hybrid combiners, yeah, right? I know. It's, so when it's you say crazy. hybrid in the, and see, to me, hybrid HD meant analog right. plus HD. It still does. Still does. So yeah, what is the yeah. hybrid you're talking the about? The hybrid that I'm talking about is uh, receivers with over the air and mobile broadband capability. On the same audio. In the same device. Or the same, okay, all right, yeah. the same device. And so, for example, what the Audi radio will do is <clears throat> um, switch from the over-the-air audio to streaming audio. Yeah. Uh, the simulcast stream of the station's audio if the broadcasters have made it available to them. And that's coming in over the mobile broadband into the vehicle. So, when, when I first started hearing about that, of course, the, as an engineer, the first thing that came to mind was, well, how are they going to sync those two things up even close? So they do that. They delay the analog. Uh, I'm sorry. They delay the over the air. Yeah. Yeah. And it needs to be within 30 seconds of the stream. Right. And it takes a couple minutes. It's done imperceptibly. Oh. Using, I don't know, you know, some fancy audio processing technology. So, if so it's they a, if slowly delay the over the air and the listeners don't notice it. Yeah. And then after a while, they're lined up. And then if they Whoa. need to switch, they do. Well, I've heard of the technology that just by the content of the audio would allow two similar but right. time disparate streams yes. uh, to get to get lined up. Yeah. So there's no sync signal. There's no embedded no, it's, signal. No, it's a fingerprinting, okay. basically. Oh, of course. But of course. they can't just uh, jump the analog, uh, the, the over-the-air audio. Right. Because that wouldn't work out. That yeah. wouldn't sound good. 
Yeah. So they slowly, you know, there's sophisticated ways of moving that. There are. Now, yeah. here's a problem, though. Uh -huh. In the U.S., broadcasters pay higher performance rights fees for streamed audio. Right. Than they right. do for over the air. Yeah. Well, when they're accomplishing this time aligning, they're streaming the audio. So the broadcaster's being billed for that, but nobody's even listening. Right. Right. So... That's a challenge. That's an issue for, for broadcasters. Yeah. It would be good to... I can tell you that one of NAB's technical committees has been thinking about that and brainstorming ways to um, minimize the impact, the financial impact. So these receivers, uh, probably mobile receivers to a large extent, would be streaming the stream and not using it until well, they not, needed to. And not right? and the listener well they're they are using it. They're using it to time align. Right. But not using it for audio. But they're not the listener's not hearing it. Right. And that's right. the 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 nasty part. Because I mean if you if you gotta pay the fees, you you at least want someone to be listening to it. Yeah. Yeah. So so but this is new and there won't be I did a little research and last year Audi sold about forty thousand of these a fours. Wow. Okay. So if they sell, they're introducing it mid year with the hybrid radio. Yeah. They're probably going to sell fewer than that. And that's not a huge number of cars. It's like 0.2%, I think, of cars sold in the U.S. So at least for the present time, this isn't going to be a catastrophically bad. Now, you, you've been describing hybrid radio. What's it called? And I sat in, uh, I guess it was an, uh, no, what was it? I sat in at the NAB radio show. Um, the uh, Toyota. It was a Toyota, um, it's a nice Toyota uh, s um, sedan. And it had the kind of radio where you didn't know if you were on AM or FM or Sirius or okay. or your built an iPod or any. You didn't know what you were on, but you had an icon for everything. Yeah. And it, what, is, does, that, does that tech have a name or that style of radio have a name? That's, I think that Toyota was probably in the Xperia booth. Yes, that's and right. I did, maybe I didn't sit in that one because I don't think that I've ever seen a, a radio which didn't allow you to select. Oh, this does allow. One of those. But your like, favorites show up and you don't really, oh, you aren't no, really conscious I, if it's. Right, right, right. You're saying that like FM. your presets can be from any of those yes, services. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. And, and the presets don't say, don't remind you, this is AM720. Right. No, it's That's just, right. you, know, yeah. uh, gotcha. you know, the bull or whatever it, yep. it may yep. be. It's just you, a, you probably sat in that sexy car that I didn't sit in. <laughs> That's just a sophisticated, you know, receiver design. I don't know that that has a name, that feature. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. just presets, okay. modern presets. Hey, I'll call it. Chris Tobin, I've been, I don't mean to ignore you, man. Hey, I, if you, had to, you know, David Layer, I want him to join us for a whole show sometime. Uh, he's with the NAB, and your title there is what with NAB? Vice President Advanced Engineering. Advanced Engineering. Yeah. Chris, that's right up your alley. You got a question for David? <laughs> no, no, you've answered it. I was, when he talked about hybrid oh, radio, uh, I was curious, but that. he answered all the questions. We're good. We're good. Cool. How's, uh, Chris, how would you say uh, HD is doing in New York City? Um, a, I don't know actually on that? how well I, I've... I haven't looked at too many research papers on it. I know talking to folks, some folks are telling me they're getting some PPM res results. Others say it works. I think the ones who are doing niche programming, you know, not dupl the HD1 is, is obvious, but HD2 and 3, I think when it's more niche rather than just playing, say, if you're a rock hey, and roll station, cool, you're playing a... One what's cool that? fact. Uh, uh, one cool fact about HD radio in New York is I believe the market penetration for auto receivers in New York is 30%. Set, that is to say, thirty percent of all vehicles on the road in that market have HD radio. No matter how old they are, I mean, those are well, added, I mean, what I mean, thirty yeah. percent of the whole. It's fleet. not like new cars. It's yeah, just yeah. the fleet, yeah. the the deployed fleet of vehicles in the New deployed, York. So yeah, new car, and that's one yeah. of the highest. And uh, I, we'd have to fact check that with Xperia, but I believe because they they study this sort of thing. But I, that's the number I've been hearing is 30%. Yeah. Yeah. And that's pretty exciting. And I think that's one of the highest, if not the highest, penetration in the country. So. And I've heard that new cars fit about over 50% now. It's, yes, over 50% of, yeah. of the new cars. Wow. So I think that's all exciting. And these new cars, all of these radios receive the all-digital AM signal. Yeah, that which was pretty is cool. cool. And then, you know, the WWFD is in, in my area. In fact, I can receive it from my house. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, and in my, you know, stock equipped, you know, HD radio in my vehicle. So uh, we heard it. Go AM. It, digital. It, it, it sounded good. I'd listen to it all day yeah, long. Yeah. You know?
Dave, absolutely. Thank you for being with us. Is there any sure. any last thing you'd like to? No, I just want to all thank the if the Wisconsin folks are listening to this, I just thank them again for having me. It's yeah. a great event. Isn't it good to bring be able to bring people together and share this information? Yeah, and yeah. It's, they do a good job of it. it. Really is. Hey, we're going to take a quick break uh, to hear from our sponsor at Lavo, and we'll be right back with a couple of final words. And I think we're going to hear from our new SBE uh, president, Wayne Pacina. So hang on, we'll be right back. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at. But, have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features that Jock only uses once in a while, so why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments, dual-mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes, and enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo radio tech at www.lawo.com slash twerk. Thanks a lot to Lavo for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. It's Kirk Harnack along with uh, Chris Tobin in New York City, and I'm in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, at the Broadcasters Clinic. It's put on every year by the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association. And we're going to wrap up the show with a couple of people who, uh, well, one you've seen before. Actually, you, you know who these guys are. John Poré, the Executive Director of the Society of Broadcast Engineers. John, welcome in. Thank you, Kirk. Good to see you. Good to be here. We, we're going to be spending the whole evening together, aren't that's we? That's right. That's right. Let's <laughs> explain that. You too. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have a fun-filled we, uh, evening ahead and, for and us. And I was going to say, are you going to be attending because you're not going to be sworn in until tomorrow, but you're on the board anyway. I'm already, yes. Wayne, Wayne Piscina, your current position on the board is? Vice President. Vice President. You're getting rid of your vices and just moving into president. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what, John, uh, why does the board of directors of the SB have to spend four hours together in a, in a meeting a uh, couple times a year? What's well, that about? You know, part of it is because we only do meet two times a year uh, as a full group. And, yeah. uh, you know, we're a nationwide organization, in fact, with members in other countries. And we're doing a lot of things. And it just takes some time to kind of go through all of those things. Yeah. You know, we have 17 committees. Uh, that are all represented here tonight with, with committee chairs. And uh, it's just a matter of going through uh, all the programs and services that we have and, and looking ahead to, uh, to make plans and, and allocate resources to make all that happen. Wow. Wow. And, and as the executive director, I, I, uh, you know, m my wife is executive director of a foundation herself. Mm -hmm. And I see so many parallels in your job. And she comes back from her board of directors meetings. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, it seems like, man, you guys could almost switch jobs. I mean, you're in broadcast, she's in nursing. But the challenges that you, that you deal with, uh, taking the ideas and advice from a board of directors, implementing those, but also giving them the information they need mm -hmm. to make intelligent decisions about you know, what's going to work, what's not, uh, what our choices are, that kind of thing. Right. That's right. A, that's a well, they're, they're, you know, we have 5,000 resources in our members. And, of course, our board of directors, 17 people that, that are kind of a cross-section, but, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, accomplished in, the, in their field. And we're, we're blessed to be able to have them on that board of directors. Uh, they do a great job to lead this organization. Our staff, you know, very proud of them. We work 
we work every day for the betterment of, S of SBE. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, yes, part of our role is to be able to give some guidance and give our views as we see things happen from a day-to-day -day basis to be able to help advise and, and, and work with the board. Now, Wayne, you're going to be moving out of your house at the Naval Observatory and moving over to <laughs> Pennsylvania that's Avenue, that's right? That's right. What's, what, <laughs> what's, what's going to be different for you going from being the vice president to the president of the SBE? Well, I think the, uh, the major uh, difference will be I'll have a, some more responsibilities in which to, uh, to oversee. Uh, certainly, uh, Jim Leifer is going to leave some very large shoes to be filled. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> big Fortunately, guy. I have big feet, yes. too, so I, I hope uh, we can uh, adequately do that. But there's a lot of, uh, again, as John mentioned, there's a lot of things going on in the FC or in the SPE. Yeah. And with that, uh, programs that began under... Uh, uh, Jim's leadership, particularly that were based on the uh, strategic planning exercise that we did, what, a year? 2018. Year, mm -hmm. 2018. And that only happens once every how many years? Well, five, five or six. Or, okay. yeah, five or okay. six. But several initiatives were identified, and implementation has begun. And what I hope to do is bring some of those to uh, reality. Some and of those were, he, uh, Jim was able to bring about pretty quickly, but others are much others, longer projects. For right? instance, our, our, our web extra uh, monthly chapter on the web meeting yeah. is one of those that was able to roll out incredibly fast. So uh, others, let's say, maybe involving redesign of the website, some of the others a lot more involved. But again, I hope to see bring those. And the other, I think, big message I have, you know, our industry has certainly changed a lot. It is continuing to change. And as an organization, uh, we have to be sure that we're changing in the right ways to meet the needs, uh, you know, of our members. Clearly, we have some signature programs we focus on, certification, mm -hmm. education, professional development, frequency coordination. But we just need to be sure we have the right programs and services that our members need to make them successful, you know, in their career as broadcast engineers. Um, are you going to uh, continue to teach some of the webinars yourself? I uh, hope to. Okay. Oh, uh, I hope, hope so. to go. <laughs> uh, I hope to kind of step back to uh, a different, you know, role to be a content provider uh -huh. rather than the chairmanship. We uh -huh. have a... Sure. Uh, a new chairman, of course, coming on board for yeah. the education committee that has a uh, actually a, probably a better background than I do. Oh, OK. In okay. education and professional development. So we're excited uh, about that. Well, I'll find out who that is tonight. Yeah, that's right. And I okay. hope you approve since uh, everything at this point is a recommendation <laughs> that right. I bring forth. Uh, we hope that will be approved and uh, we'll make that uh make that public but okay. uh, certainly the education efforts will continue and again i do hope to continue uh to providing some of the content some things are already scheduled we got others you know in the works all right i look forward to it and i look forward to spending four hours with you guys tonight all right yeah, yeah let's thanks, hope Kurt. it's only four hours <laughs> john Poré <laughs> and Kurt. wayne Pasina with sbe Pleasure. hey we gotta go we are flat out of time chris tobin you got any last minute uh, things you want to pass on before we say goodbye? No, no, just uh, the two gentlemen there. Congratulations, good luck, continued success. I enjoy seeing all the notes out of SBE organization at uh, HQ, and I think you're going to have a great time at uh, the uh, conference, as always. I was there last year. I enjoyed it greatly. I look forward to next year. I can tell you, we miss you because you, you lighten up every party and you bring lots of information. And, you know, oftentimes you're just the voice of reason. So. <laughs> Yeah, I know. When I, I go off on a, a tangent, you, you pull it. me back in. <laughs> 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 All right. Hey, we got to go. Thanks a lot to our sponsors, and thanks a lot to uh, Josh Bone at Max Connect. You can see lots of signal there on uh, AT&T and Verizon, and we appreciate all of our sponsors. Uh, thanks a lot to Suncast, our producer for the show, and thanks a lot to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, where you'll find lots of cool podcasts, including What the Tech, that just aired before this show did. Chris Tobin, thank you very much. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.